you guys are looking better this morning. Because uh, after a year and a half, I got a new pair of glasses. <laughs> and I realized I was stumbling through at times trying to read the scripture. It wasn't because I can't read it, I couldn't see it well. A year and a half ago, I lost my glasses. Uh, we were clearing some brush at the church and putting a pile up together. And they, the limb caught my glasses and flung into the brush. But they were rimless glasses. It was like needle in a haystack. Mike and uh, Linda Kellogg even went through the stack trying to find my glasses. Spent a whole afternoon after church and they couldn't find it. JW and I, we gave up. So I wore my backup glasses. We had those black rims, which I didn't like. But I thought I was going to get my cataracts removed and I haven't gotten around to it. So I went to my doctor and uh, he's a corneal surgeon. And he checked my eyes. He says, they're in great shape. You can get your cataracts in a year or two, and it won't hurt anything. You just will see a lot more beautiful colors. So um, in the meantime, I, I said, OK, I'll get some new glasses. I didn't realize that by my choice of getting new glasses, I could see so much better. So <laughs> that, that's a big help. And see, if you want God to do things in your life, You've got to make choices. There's many people that have this in their mindset that, well, I'm, God is omnipotent, so he's already made all my decisions. So no matter what happens, everything's going to be like he wants. That is not true. Because God has us making choices that he won't make for us. Now, frankly, we know what we're supposed to do, but that doesn't mean we're going to do it, is it? And frankly, sometimes we make disastrous choices. So when somebody has in their mind, well, it's all predestined, no, it's not. No, it's not. There's a lot of uh, lives that are missing the point. In fact, the majority of people miss their purpose that God has for them. Does that change what God wants? No. But they miss their choices, they miss their blessings, and they wonder, well, why aren't God's blessings on me like I think they should be? Because if you're not where God wants you to be, the blessings won't flow. Consider Moses. He led the nation of Israel out of slavery after 400 years. Now, God tells him, I'm going to take you to a land of milk and honey and everything's going to be wonderful. The promised land. But you've got to make some choices. You've got to decide to leave Egypt and go. And so the promised land was not automatic. Consider uh, Jeremiah 29, 11. This is, I don't think I put it, it might be on the screen. Um, I added this after I did y'all's notes. Um, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. That's God's plan for you. He doesn't want you crushed, run over, stomp, no, he wants you to have a hope and a future. Now, he'll bring you through difficult times. And sometimes we think we're going to have terrible things happen to us, and we can say, yeah, it's going to come. And God just knocks it away in ways we never dreamed possible, because he's God and we're not. But there comes a time when our choices dramatically affect us, those we love, and those around us. And Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15. God says, today I'm giving you a choice. Does that sound like predestined? No. He says, I'm giving you a choice. You can choose right or wrong, it's your choice. You can choose life and success or death and disaster. Hmm. I want life and success, not death and disaster. How about you? But unfortunately, many don't. He says, I'm commanding you to love the Lord your God with all, to, all your God to live the way he has told you and obey his laws and teachings. You're about to cross the Jordan River and take the land that he's given you. If, it's a big word, if, two letters, but it's huge. If you obey him and you live and become successful and powerful. So the promise is not, is given 
to those who make the right choices. The promise is not given to you if you say, well, I'm going to thumb my nose at God and I'm going to go my own way. He says, fine, you can go just like the prodigal son. You realize the prodigal son, the father didn't go run after him. He waited until he came to his senses and came home. So the blessings come when you come to the Father. Now, as your pastor, I want you to succeed. I don't want you to fail. I want you to accomplish great things. I want you to bring great honor to God. And it doesn't, you know, if you're single or you're married, it doesn't matter if you have children, wonderful. And if you succeed as a professional, fantastic. But it all begins by making your choice. I am going to love God with all my heart. I'm going to follow him, and I will worship him with all my heart. So life and death are here. Joy and happiness are the opposite. Consider Deuteronomy 30, verse 17. But if you obey, disobey, so you're paying attention, if you disobey and refuse to listen and are led away to worship other gods, you will be destroyed. That's kind of to the point, isn't it? God says, this is what's going to happen to you. You'll be destroyed. You will not live long in that land across the Jordan that you are about to occupy. I'm giving you the choice between life and death, between God's blessings or a curse. I call heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Choose life. Notice God's saying, hey, I've given you the choices, but please Choose life. So God doesn't have us as a puppet. You know, you got a puppet and you just do like this and the puppet does whatever you want. Or a marionette where you got those strings and you play around. That was, I remember seeing that first in The Sound of Music when they were doing those marionettes. I go, well, that's interesting. But it's not interesting if you're the one on the strings. (laughs) It's somebody else deciding what you do, how you do it, and when you do it. So the choice is between a blessing and a curse, whatever you want. Now, Moses' life was shaped by choices. Um, He was given to lead by God the nation of Israel, to bring them to their choice, and they had to choose to follow him or not. Now, Moses, of course, was the most significant person in the Old Testament. Um, He unified the nation, led them out of slavery. He gave them the first five books in the Bible, not just the Ten Commandments, the first five books. It's called the Pentateuch. And so the challenge here in Hebrews 11, 23. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's eating. Now, what's going on here? When the... uh, Israel came, they were the sons. That was it, you know. You had a small little band led by Joseph, who was at that time the prime minister of Egypt. It's amazing. The Jewish little boy became the prime minister of Egypt. But it grew over 140 years to millions. And so the Pharaoh of Egypt says, We got a problem. These Hebrews over here, they're outnumbering us. And they're not Egyptian. We are. So we got to do something about that. So he made an edict that they would kill the firstborn son to knock down their numbers. And they forced them into slavery to break them down, to make them do what they wanted. And uh, so there was a problem. Moses was born. Now the word Moses is from the Hebrew is Moshe, the one who draws out. And so he drew the nation out of Israel, out of bondage in Egypt to the promised land. And remember, Egypt in the scriptures are always viewed as a place of sin, promised land, a place of blessings and joy by God. And so they was pulling them out of the place of sin into the blessings of God. Look further. By faith, Moses, when he grew up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated among the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. Let me stop there. You know, his parents 
hit him. Not fair in the king. And then he is found by Pharaoh's daughter. They said, great, this will be my son. And they said, well, who can we raise him? Well, his parents raised him. But now, because he was a grandson of Pharaoh, he had access to the luxuries of the world. Since his grandfather was a ruler and his, his grandfather was, perceived himself as a god, um, he had everything. But instead of doing that, he said, no, I'm making a choice. Now further, he regarded this grace for the sake of Christ as a far greater value than the treasures of Egypt because looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Now notice there's order to the story. Moses, Moshe, the one who draws out, is a special child. His parents noticed that and protected him. They didn't want him killed. And then as a child... He is raised, he gets all the education, everything of Egypt, all the teaching of what their beliefs were, but see, his parents had already rooted and grounded him in God's word. Let me say this. I hear this from time to time, parents going, well, I, I'll, I'm not going to tell my kids what to believe. I, I'm just going to let them figure it out. When they get old enough, they'll make a decision. No! No! You teach them all about God, and let, they have to make a decision, but you teach them and let them know this is the way. Then when it's time to make a decision, they'll make the right decision, most likely. But see, Moses was hearing all how to run the world and how that his grandfather was a god and all this stuff. And he's being taught that this is the way the world is. But instead of going along with that, he rejected it because... He learned from his mother and father. Very important. You know, you think about it. You say, well, I don't want to teach my kids about God. Let them make decisions. You know what? Do you tell your children when it's time to go to bed during school? Yes. you got to basically hide the phones and stuff from them. And what if your kids say, well, I don't want to eat food. I just want to eat Twinkies all day and drink red Kool-Aid. Boy, they'll be bouncing off the wall. You go, no, no, you've had enough Twinkies, okay? You know, why in the world would you do that with the most major decisions, the beliefs that will shape their life and hereafter? So make sure they know what you believe, why you believe it, and make sure you raise them so they make those decisions. So when Moses, you know, here he's taught by his parents, but still there's a time for all of us to make a choice. Now you think about it. As a teenager, Moses has a Mercedes boat on the Nile River. He drives a Lamborghini. I mean, he has the treasures, I mean... He has young ladies that will peel grapes for him. He has everything imaginable. But when it came time to choose, he chose God. He chose God. So a few things that I want you to get out of that. Look back at that verse. First, Moses refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He refused. That was a decision he had to make. Do you go with all this lap of luxury or be with the slaves? And if you look on the world, it goes, oh, I'd easily take the luxuries. But instead, he chose God's path. Second, he chose, so circle that, to be mistreated with God's people. You know, who's, who's chose to be mistreated? But he did. Third, he regarded, so circle regarded, the sake of Christ of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. See, he had been taught to believe about God the Father. You realize this book wasn't written yet. 
he had to receive it from his parents, how they worshiped the one true God who you couldn't put a statue of. You had to worship him in spirit and truth. And here the Egyptians go, well, here are our gods. See these big old things here? They, they don't move. They don't do anything, but they're our gods. And, but he was taught to believe, to worship God in spirit and truth. And four, he persevered. Circle persevered because he saw him who is invisible. And I, I tell you in my life, the driving force that's kept me going is God's presence. Because there's many highs and lows in life. Of course, when you're young, you think you know, life you know, don't have that perspective. But I've seen so many highs and lows, and yet I know the one thing is consistent. God got me through it all and will continue to do so. I have that total, absolute confidence that God's in control. So you make your choices, and that will determine your destiny. Whether you will walk with God or you won't, and make those choices. So a few things about this. Um, I refused to be defined by others. I refused to be defined by others. See, all of us have to make choices. I'm going to give you some choices to make. Refuse to be defined by others. So as an adult, you make a decision, I'm going to follow Christ. And you choose not to let others define you as something different. So in Hebrews 11, 24, by faith, Moses, when he was grown up, he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. See, Moses had an identity crisis. Should he live in the lap of luxury with all this stuff, which the world says you're supposed to do, and God says, no, it's, you don't. You realize, think on this. If he chose to remain in the palace, have all the luxuries and everything the world could offer, we would not know about him. He would be just another obscure prince in, in Egypt that are millions. And he may or may not have a tomb adored after him because he was, would not have risen to be in a pharaoh. He would just be one of the grandsons. Instead, we'd still talk about him 6,000 years later because he chose to walk with God. So when you get to heaven, you're going to see Moses. You get to meet him. He'll ask you, did you read my five books? <laughs> Especially those ten God gave me. See, he, he could have, instead, he chose, hey, I'm a Hebrew. Humiliation. Can you imagine? He had his closest friend. And they turned their back on him. Oh, you're not one of us? You're not in the palace anymore? You're not one of the rulers? You know, yeah, you can live with those slaves over there. So you don't live, you know, so many times in this world we live where we want our friends to like what we do, our co-workers. We, you know, sometimes we have a parent, we want to live up to those expectations that are not what God wants us to do. Don't let peer pressure or other things determine your destiny. Now think about, it. well, I'm a grown up. I don't get peer pressure anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of funny. One of the perks when you move up in the corporate ladder, you get the key to the private restroom. And the, some guys, will, I mean, they'll do about anything to get that key because that's the status symbol, the bathroom key. It's amazing. Or what about fashion? No, okay. What suits in store? You know, are you supposed to wear a suit, blue jeans? Depends on what company you are. You know, frankly, some major companies they wear blue jean t-shirts now, and others wear a coat and tie. So you better figure out which company you're going to go to work for, what to wear when you go on the interview. Hmm. 
And you say, well, and you see your neighbor, he's got Kim Long doing his yard, you know, it's, and it's greener than yours. So then you've got to research some chemicals better than, true, better than them so you can put it on your yard so your yard will be greener than their yard. Mm. Competition. You know, my social media has more likes than yours. You're right. Who cares? <laughs> I don't care. I don't care if you block me. Okay, block me. You don't like me? Fine, block me. I don't care. It's not going to change my world. See, Moses refused to live a lie. He chose, say, I am a Hebrew. I am a worshiper of God. Romans 12, 2. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold, but let God remold your minds from within, so you may prove and practice that the plan of God for you is good. You know, when you say, well, everybody else is doing it. You've given over your identity to somebody else. I don't care if the whole world is going away from God. I'm going to stay true to God no matter what it costs me. In 1 Thessalonians 2.4, our purpose is to please God, not people. Hmm. Have you seen that before? Our purpose is to please God, not people. He is the one who examines the motives of our hearts. So the big issue, you need to decide, what is my identity? Am I a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have I accepted him as my Savior? Am I a worshiper of God Almighty or not? Hmm. Don't fear what others may say or do. Fear him who can, after he kills the body, can cast you into hell. That's what the Bible says. Fear God. Don't fear any man. In Jeremiah 29, 11, I'm, I'm giving this to you again because I want to emphasize this. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for your good, plans to prosper you, not to harm you. They are plans to give you hope and a future. i just make it real clear to you. Satan doesn't want to give you a hard time. He doesn't want to lead you around the long path. He wants to destroy you. And the more he can keep you as a believer... Busy doing busyness instead of accomplishing the A's in your life, he wins in that regard. So focus on the most important things, and if you get to the other things, well, great. But take care of the big stuff. You know, how long you can continue like you are 10, 20 years, 30, who knows? Make sure you make every day count because you don't know when the time is up. Second, Choose short gain, short term pain over long term gain. Choose short term pain over long term gain. Now, in the short run, uh, Moses looked kind of stupid. Oh, you're going to leave the palace? You're going to put on clothes of a Hebrew? Hmm. You know, those people are stinky shepherds. You know, we look at movies and stuff and we go, oh, isn't that so nice? They're shepherds, yeah. In Egyptian society, of course, the highest was the Pharaoh's family and so forth. But the person on the very bottom rung of society, the lowest of low, were shepherds. You know, we make them really nice in Christmas programs and stuff. Oh, the shepherds came and found Jesus. Yeah, the lowest of the low were allowed to greet the kingdom of God. He says, I'm here for everybody. So you can't say, I'm too low to come to God. No, God comes where you are. So he left the palace behind and chose to live with God's people. So he had a lot of short-term pain. Do you realize the average American is $18,000 in debt? Why? Because delayed gratification. We want this, we want that, we want the other. Okay, I don't have the money to pay for it. So you pull out the card. And you charge up that car, it goes here. And you just pay, the, pay a little bit every month. And you pay that huge 26% interest rate. Mm-mm-mm. Why? Because we want it now. God says, save it up and pay for it, and you'll have a much better life. But that puts you into bondage. 
It, it's sad, but they're even trying to get your kids to have credit cards. Now, here's the problem. And I talked about this back when I was in college to my roommate who was a non-believer. Well, he was, we call him sweet mate. I had a believer with me, and he had a restroom. He had another two guys over here. And Tran was his name. He was a biology, microbiology student. Very smart guy. So he was on the other side. And so I would talk to him. He said, nah, it's, it's nothing. You know, um, you know it, it didn't compute all of this to him. Um, I, I never was able to lead him to Christ, but I tried for the year that he was in the other side. The most important decision you'll make is you accept it. Jesus says not. But then God wants you to live your life effectively. And so that you can you realize the reason God has blessed you with a lot, the purpose is so you can bless others. See, it's not so we can just hoard it into ourselves. It's the purpose is to bless others and be a blessing. In Hebrews eleven twenty five. Moses chose to be mistreated among, with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. Hmm. You know, if sin wasn't fun, people wouldn't do it. You realize that? <laughs> it's good for a short time. And then, then the bill comes due. And when that bill comes due, uh, some people really don't want to pay it, but it's, it's there. And notice it's fun for a season, for a finite period of time, and then game's up. So God says, I want you to avoid that game's up. I want you to miss out on the punishment and the dealings you have to do with that. Because, you know, sin is called, it was extremely costly, extremely Now, here's the other thing. Some people live off their parents or their spouse's spiritual development. You know, they go, well, you know, the wife is the one that prays, or the husband is the one that prays, or the parents, oh, my grandparents all pray for me. I've had people, I've talked to them about their relationship with God. They go, well, my grandmother's a great Christian. Okay, that's great. What about you? Well, you know, I've got other th- I want to sow my wild oats. Yeah, but those wild oats wind up going into the ground and they sprout up and they root up things you wish you never saw. Yeah. So Moses manned up and he says, I'm not going to take the pleasures of Egypt anymore. I'm going to walk with God. So God will use it to help me grow. You realize that? All you go through, God will use it to help you grow. Romans 5, verse 3. We can have the joy in our troubles because we know that these troubles produce patience and patience produces character and character produces hope. Being a believer is not an absence of trials. Mm -mm, The trials are going to come. But he's going to be with you through those trials. And the trials will do what? They just strengthen your character. And so when other trials come, what happens? Okay, I got another trial. I can face it. And yet you see other people that get all broken up, upset, mad, they're mad at the world. They're blaming everybody for their problems. No, what do I need to do now? Deal it one day at a time and let God bless you and help you through with it. Why? Because God wants you to grow spiritually. He wants you to grow emotionally. He wants you to grow mentally. And the way he does it, lets those trials come, but you break through them with his power. Notice, his power, not your power. Mm-hmm. So, some of us guys, we try real power. I, I can take on, I'm John Wayne. Uh, no, that was a movie John Wayne was in. Great guy, but that was a movie. And God will reward me in heaven. God will reward me in heaven. Now, I'll tell you this. God will bless you here on earth, and those blessings are great, 
But you know what? The more important blessings are in heaven. 2 Corinthians 4.17. These present troubles are quite small. Of course, when you're going through a trouble, a trial, it seems quite big. <clears throat> Just know that. <clears throat> but and won't last very long. When you compare things to eternity, no trouble we have here lasts very long. Yet they produce for us an immeasurably great glory that will last forever. So as you prove yourself going through these trials and God strengthens you through those, what happens? It builds your character and those blessings you receive from that continue forever. Consider, you can take it easy now and it'll be harder later in life because you don't develop the habits of spiritual growth. Or you can work hard now, have a difficult time, but strengthen your character and it'd be easier later. I want the easier later. In fact, in this journey in my life, I'm having the easier later because I've been through the wars, the fights, and everything else. It actually gets easier as you get older. And see, when you get, as you get older, you've learned that pride comes before the fall. So you don't go puffed up in pride, oh, I can handle it, I can take it on. No, I know I can't. God can take it on, and I'm going to do what he tells me to do at that point in time. I've learned, boy, I've seen, the, you know, I've done it before. Get all prideful and think I can take on the, yeah. And he, God has no problem humiliating us when we get prideful. Just back you down, okay. You think you can handle it? He just backs off and lets you fall off your ladder. And then he comes on, dusts you off, okay, let's get going. You know, picks you up and sends you back on your way. Three, choose what God values, not what culture values. Choose what God values, not what culture values. It's amazing. In our culture, what's considered important. And you know what, what's important today in culture may not be important tomorrow. In fact, what was important today may be trash tomorrow, and then some crazy other thing is up over here. You go, yeah, that's the world. Hebrews eleven twenty six. Moses regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as far greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. You know, the things we have here are temporary. He says, I'm looking on the eternal. The older you get, you realize eternal is more important than now. So he evaluates, he considers the praises, considers the judgment of everything. And he says, I've decided what matters most, serving God. Can you name ten major values of your life? It's interesting to think about. What about two major values? Let me tell you what the world values. Popularity, prestige, power. That's what the world is. I want to be popular. I want the prestige. I can say something and do whatever I want to. I want the power, raw power. That's where the world is. That's from verse 24. In verse 25, pleasure, the pleasures of sin. Oh, I can do what I want when I want, no repercussions. Hmm. Sounds like some politicians to me. <laughs> But you know what? It sounds like people throughout the world. What about verse about 26? It's possessions, the treasures of Egypt. He says, I don't need those possessions. He you say, you're walking around, you put those bank accounts, all that stuff. Yeah, that's right. In 1 John 2, 17, the world and everything in that world that people desire is passing away. But those who do the will of God will live forever. You know, we, we have things. You, you think about this. I've got stuff from my mom, okay? And she had it from her mother and from our great-grandmother. Stuff. 
from my father's side, I, I have a table and chairs. Um, you know, we have that stuff. It means something to me, but will it mean something to somebody else? Yes. No. But it's, so when I'm gone, that's, that's just, it'll go in some garage sale. <laughs> and what doesn't sell at the garage sale will be in the dumpster. And yet those were important to some people in the past. Hmm. What God values. God's purpose is more important than popularity. God's purpose is more important than popularity. Here's a smart move. Choose God's purpose. Way more. You know, consider here grandson of Pharaoh, who knows how the world goes. He could have wound up being a Pharaoh. Could have. But of course, Pharaoh's primary job was to have kids. And so there was a bunch of kids. If you know anything about Egyptology, I mean, they had lots of kids. That was their job. But you know, he would have been a nobody had he stayed in Egypt. Stayed in Pharaoh's household. Now, 6,000 years, we remember him. So therefore, God's purpose is more important than popularity. He laid aside popularity for something far better. And people are more important than pleasure. You learn that from verse 25. God's value system is always more important than pleasure. So Moses traded the royal life to the life of that of a slave. Now further, peace of mind is more valuable than possessions. Hmm. You know the people, they play the lottery and want to win the lottery, and yet the most likely outcome is they're bankrupt in three years and they're very miserable. It's amazing. I want peace of mind. He considered doing the right thing of greater value, serving God, than Egypt and all of its possessions. He says they're worthless. Do you realize what I'm saying here is that Moses gave up everything to spend his life for a dream and was rewarded for it because he was looking for the reward that God would give him in heaven. Four, choose to live by faith, not by fear. Moses had every reason to be scared to death. He had every reason to be afraid. He was up against the most powerful man in the world who viewed himself as a god. So therefore, since he viewed himself as a god, if you walked into, frankly, you would walk in, but then they'd throw you to the ground. And then, the, then you would look up, and the first thing you'd see was his feet. And his feet would remind you that he had authority over you. It could crush you. And when they might let you stand, maybe not. But if he decided uh, off with his arms, they would just cut your arms off. Yeah, you're, you're just nothing because he's a God and you're not. That's how Pharaoh looked at himself. And yet Moses walks in standing tall. It's interesting. The guards knew who he was. <laughs> and they were certainly perplexed because here he was Pharaoh's grandson, but now he's given that away. He's a Hebrew. But he walks in. I don't find it recorded anywhere where they threw him to the ground like they would do anybody else. But Pharaoh could have easily said, off with his head, or hang him out for the vultures to eat. But he didn't fear Pharaoh, because he said, Pharaoh, hey, you're not God. God is God, and you're not. You're just a mere man. And so he, Moses didn't fear Pharaoh, even though he had... Pharaoh thought he had life and death of him, but God had put a protection on Moses. He couldn't touch him. You think about that. The only way he could be, Moses could go through what he wanted to is God's protection. So he looked at Mo, Pharaoh, Moses did, and says, you're not the higher authority. God's the higher authority. He's over you. And I'll, sometime I'll do a series on the plagues of Egypt, each one of the plagues was against the gods of Egypt. 
And so Moses was showing, well, God was showing through Moses that God was more powerful than the gods of Egypt. And see, the last one, the firstborn, passed away because he viewed him as the sun god. And so God's showing he had power over even Pharaoh. So he was the supreme god and he wasn't. So each one of those plagues are by choice over the gods of Egypt. And so he says, you know, you're, you're not a god, you're not a mini-me, you're nothing compared to God, Pharaoh. So the key in faith is trusting God no matter what you face. You've got to put your faith in the right thing. Now, you know, a lot of people put their faith in stuff. Well, I got my faith because I've got this huge bank account. Okay. You know, realize everybody, consider this, Steve Jobs, his enormous bank account couldn't save him from pancreatic cancer. Okay. Some people put their faith in the, what possessions they have. Well, they're just stuff. And some people say, oh, I'll put my faith in myself. Don't do that. <laughs> have you walked on water? Have you made every right decision? No. You put your faith in God who will then guide you to make those right decisions. In Hebrews eleven twenty seven, by faith Moses left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. So you, if you, you come to God, you keep your eyes on him. So when you're going through a difficult time, somebody, you know, it's always, when somebody's going through a difficult time, they'll have open mail and their houses tend to be in disarray because they're just overwhelmed. What you got to do, you've got to say, okay, what do I need to do today? Don't try to do everything. Don't try to fix your world all at once. Okay, what's the one thing I can do? Do that. And the next day, okay, what can I do tomorrow? You arrive there, what needs to get done? The most important thing, and do that. Don't worry about everything else. And it's amazing when you take that perspective, you trust in God, you pray what I'm supposed to do, and you start dealing with the most important thing, what happens? It changes your life. And everything fits together. But it doesn't happen. In, see, we want it instant. You know, like instant everything. We want it all right now. You know, it, it's amazing to me. New graduates from college expect to have what their parents have spent their whole life accumulating. And they want it at their first job. Yeah. <laughs> well, I got, I got a degree in basket weaving. So I want to make as much as my father who's an engineer. Not going to happen. <laughs> Not going to happen. We want it now. God says, no. You take one day at a time. You trust me, and I'll make sure you have what you're supposed to have. In Galatians 2.16, no one can please God by simply obeying his law. I remember a guy back in high school, he said, well, I haven't sinned. I mean, yeah, right. And you would name off, well, that's, I, don't believe, I don't accept that sin. You know what? Whether you accept it or not, God said it, and that settles it. So that's how that goes. But obeying the law won't get you to heaven. Ask the rich young ruler that, you know, he went away sorrowfully. So we put our faith in Jesus Christ, and God accepted us because of our faith. Your faith makes you acceptable, nothing else. By the way, Jesus Christ, yes, that's two names, but it's not his first and last name. Some people think that's not true. Jesus is Yahshua, the Savior, the Redeemer. Christ is his title, the Anointed One, is literally what it means. And so his name is Yahshua. That's where you get Joshua from, by the way, Yahshua. He's the Messiah. You have the Messiah, and he's the anointed one. That's why those two do together. It's not his first and last name. It's always interesting talking to people about that. Oh, that's his last name. No, it's not his last name. <laughs> um, so you put your faith in our Savior, Jesus. And you live in the light of eternity. You don't get bogged down here and now. You know, bottom line is sometimes you got to stop worrying about what other people think, what the world is saying you're supposed to do now. 
you know, one thing about the, like the world of fashion, you know, you know, one day it's in fashion, sometimes it's out of fashion. Who knows? You know, some of people say the one with the most toys at the end wins. No, he's dead. Somebody else has his toys. Mm. And you know what? You can work real hard and make it in that rat race, but at the end, you're still a rat. You think? Because you think about it. The next few weeks, I'm going to be talking about making major choices, and I'm going to tell you about a guide to help you. And I'll tell you who that guide is. It's the Holy Spirit. So, don't go. Well, who's the guide around? I'm just telling you, it's the Holy Spirit, and He's available to everybody. And he'll help you make the right choices. And further, you need to choose the right companions. Make sure the people that you choose close to you have your same interests and values at heart. That people that love you and care for you, and you love and care for them. So when you mess up, they go, what you doing? <laughs> they don't run off and say, oh, I'm going to be associated with it. No, they go, what are you doing, Max? Wake up, smack you upside the head. And because they love you, you go, okay, okay, yes, you're right. So choose the right companions. And determine what doors you want to walk through. Which doors you want to walk past and never go to. Those are decisions you make that will shape your life for the better. So we've got a lot to look for the next couple of weeks. But begin that first step by knowing Jesus as your Savior, then the rest is a daily walk with God. Let's pray. Lord, I don't want to drift through life. I don't want to be aimless and moving here and there without direction or purpose. Help me have purpose like Moses. May you shape our commitment and our thoughts by looking at these three life-changing choices. Because life doesn't happen automatically. It's what we do. Please help us to not let others define us, but let you define us. We are children of God. And our Heavenly Father watch over his children daily. And help us to be like Moses, who chose short-term pain over long-term gain. Because the long-term is far more important than short-term. God, I want you to help us to choose to help us make the best decisions for the rest of our lives by choosing the best values despite our culture that's around us that won't last. And I want to choose to put you first by my faith every day. I realize I can only do things, all of us can only do these things through your grace and power. We can't do it by determination, being hard-headed. doesn't work. By your grace and power and our commitments to you make this possible. Help us, Jesus. We need you daily. I humbly ask for your help and your faith to start moving in each of us today. And I ask you to save us, empower us, to guide us, and help us stop making excuses or blaming others, but say, I'm going to be faithful at my church at New Hope. I'm going to make a difference where God has placed me. We're going to be the light to our community and to the world. I'm going to accept you, accept us together in this family of God, and we humbly pray in faith for your help daily. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together for this time.